यूनियन मिनिस्टर ऑफ पेट्रोलियम एंड नेचुरल गैस श्री धर्मेंद्र प्रधान जी मिनिस्टर ऑफ हेल्थ उड़ीसा श्री नायक कॉन्क्लेव कोऑर्डिनेटर श्री जगदानंद वाइस चेयरमैन सी आई उड़ीसा डॉक्टर तपन कुमार चंद डिस्टिंग्विश गेस्ट फ्रेंड्स एंड मेम्बर्स ऑफ द मीडिया यू नो आई नोन धर्मेंद्र प्रधान जी सेंस आई अराइव हेयर इन न्यू डेली uh in january 2015 and i found today the kind of passion he has when he speaks in odia is quite a different experience uh i i don't understand odia language although let me say that you know my name sometimes i have well, actually not sometimes but most of the times get confused with pani grahi and therefore i am taken for and odia but uh, but i get pretty quickly exposed when people then try to communicate to me in odia and i'm sort of dumbfound um i am sure the minister has already told you quite a lot uh, I, at least from uh, some of the things that i could understand uh, he has given you uh, a, a fantastic journey uh, he has taken you through a fantastic journey of what uh, uh prime minister modi has been doing uh and uh, what is to come uh and i will only be complimenting uh both uh, with an e and i what what the minister has uh, said uh first of all i think you know picking up on uh, one of the key themes that he developed uh, that he uh, discussed uh let me also say that you know the days when states used to look up to the central government uh are uh, rapidly getting behind us uh in the 1950s 60s and 70s uh states typically looked for guidance uh, uh to the center and i know that when pandit jawarlal nehru was the prime minister uh he would write a monthly letter to each chief, chief minister providing guidance on what they might want to do with in the states uh i think now the the situation is turning around uh states have taken charge uh and uh, the central government under prime minister modi has been very quick to recognize that reality uh indeed under the 14th finance commission uh the devolution uh of the uh, shareable revenues was increased from 32 to 40% there was a big huge change uh partly i suspect that the finance commission team itself saw uh where prime minister modi was heading uh when it made that particular recommendation uh but uh, it also took prime minister modi no time to uh accept that uh, recommendation wholeheartedly uh he had argued uh, uh in a variety of ways uh, that states ought to be empowered when he was a chief minister of gujarat and that thought stayed with him when he became the prime minister uh he also in a way the replacing of the of the planning commission by the niti aayog is a part of that same cooperative federalism spirit that he has fostered evidently uh under the planning commission uh the planning commission used to you know the the extra 10% the extra 10% that was added by the 14 finance commission to the devolution part of that money was used to be dispersed by the planning commission uh and while you know i had never visited the planning commission before except in the late 1980s when dr manmohan singh was uh, the deputy chairman of the planning commission uh i am told that the corridors of the planning commission used to be filled with the chief ministers and the ministers from the states because the planning commission used to give this money and planning commission often sat in judgment over the states uh it uh, made decisions on what projects the states could do and projects the states could not do but today that is no longer the case uh niti aayog corridors are uh, if anything uh, there uh, with either the corporates or the civil society uh representatives uh, not the chief ministers or uh, ministers of the states uh so the discourse uh, between the niti aayog 
uh, end the state's noise of a very different kind. Uh, uh, chief ministers don't come to the states. I typically go to the states uh, uh, with ideas. Now, you know, Niti Aayog is a think tank. Uh, it has to earn its living by creating ideas, by promoting ideas, uh, and of course, most importantly, Niti Aayog has to study the successful experiments that different states are doing and therefore the best practices that the states develop and then diffuse them to the other states. So this is one of the things we have been doing uh, while interacting with the states. Recently we have even brought out a book uh, which documents a series of uh, best practices from different states in different areas uh, and uh, the book is just to be released, uh, which we'll be sending out to the chief ministers and the chief secretaries of the states uh, very soon. So uh, now, under Prime Minister Modi, we uh, have uh, what uh, he calls the Team India. Uh, the governing body of the Niti Aayog uh, uh, includes not only, not just the representatives of the central government. Uh, Prime Minister, of course, is the chairman of Niti Aayog and uh, several of the uh, senior cabinet uh, members uh, uh, are members of the governing body of uh, the Niti Aayog, but most importantly now, uh, chief ministers of all the states and lieutenant governors of some of the UTs are also uh, full members of the Niti Aayog, so therefore it truly uh, brings the states and uh, the central government together on uh, a single platform, uh, and that again is part of the spirit of uh, cooperative federalism that uh, uh, the Prime Minister has fostered. So let me say the uh, uh, Honourable Minister had said that we hold this uh, uh, some, in some form, uh, we uh, bring uh, this conclave or the, uh, at least some of the conclusions and, and lessons that the conclave derives to New Delhi also and we'll certainly be very happy to do that. That is a part of uh, uh, our mandate. Uh, we work with the states uh, and uh, this will be truly a first uh, for us actually because it's, it's not that we are coming to the states but it, uh, states will come, come to New Delhi uh, and that is an incredibly welcome. Uh, development for the Niti Aayog. Uh, let me also say, as, as the minister had correctly surmised, that this is really the first time on a, I'm, I'm on the dais with the civil society, uh, the corporates, and of course representatives of the government. Uh, with that, let me just say a few things about uh, uh, some of the themes. After all, I'm uh, not just the vice chairman of Niti Aayog, but I'm also an economist, and, and I thought I'll share with some of my thoughts as an economist as well. Uh, I looked through the list of uh, uh, various subjects that are going to be discussed at the conclave, uh, and uh, those are all uh, eminently sensible subjects, very important ones, uh, ones that uh, touch the people. Uh, uh, whether it be in uh, area of health, area of education, livelihood, uh, etc. These are all uh, issues that touch the people directly and therefore very much uh, very important for the conclave to discuss, see how uh, we can make progress uh, going forward in these different areas. However, let me mention one very important subject which also should be on uh, the, on the uh, agenda of the conclave, uh, which at least in the listing I have not seen, but it is very, very important and indeed. It is the backbone of everything else that you want to do, and that is uh, the subject of growth. Uh, we have uh, often kind of uh, 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 neglected, I think, you know, paying the attention to growth that growth deserves. Why? Because in the end, uh, all the social programs that you are going to discuss, now we heard actually from uh, the representative of the social, uh, of the civil society that, you know, there's not enough in the budget uh, to be spent on education, there's not enough in the budget to be spent on health, there's not enough to be spent in the budget on livelihood. But remember where the revenues are going to come from. In the end, revenues come from taxes that are paid on the income. If the income base itself is very low, taxes you're going to generate will also be low, and therefore the expenditures on the various social programs that the government will be able to do will also be low. In the end, all the development expenditures that the states, uh, that the government do, both the central government and the state governments, depend very heavily on uh, the level of GDP, which determines uh, how much tax revenue can be collected. So 
growth is very important from that point of view, but also do not underestimate the value of growth uh, that comes directly. When economies grow rapidly, they create jobs, they raise wages, and, and that directly empowers people. When people's wages are uh, sufficiently high, when their own incomes are high, they are much more empowered then. Not only they can provide themselves the daily needs, which is uh, 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 from food, clothing, and shelter, uh, to the other things, but also their own ability to access the public services improves. So, you know, if the government provides health services, but I don't have enough income to actually to be able to take a bus to the primary health care center, which might be in the village next door, uh, I cannot access those services. So, therefore, increase in the people's incomes uh, is also a very, part, very important part of empowerment, uh, which allows them to access the uh, publicly provided social services. In fact, Odisha's own experience, actually Odisha, Odisha, uh, Odisha grew uh, rather rapidly from 2003-04 to 2009-10. And that is also the period during which India itself grew about you know, over 8%. Uh, Odisha, uh, Odisha grew even faster than that. And it is on the back of that growth that actually the development expenditures in Odisha could grow much more rapidly. And, and let us not forget that on the one hand, again, I heard this from the uh, earlier speakers, that the poverty levels in Odisha are extremely high, uh, which is correct. Actually, you can look up the, the data in our poverty line. The Tendulkar line that we use is a relatively modest poverty line. And even by that, the poverty levels in Odisha uh, are very high. The general poverty levels, as well as the poverty levels among the scheduled tribes, among the scheduled castes. But let us also not forget that the poverty levels today are far lower than what they were even in 2004-05. Actually, tremendous progress has been made in combating poverty, in bringing poverty down. I could actually give you some figures. 2004-05, uh, 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 the overall aggregate you know, in the entire population, rural plus urban, poverty rate in Odisha was about 58%. Today, it's about 33%. So we have seen uh, some progress, uh, actually considerable progress from coming down from about 58% down to 33%. Uh, that is a substantial progress we have actually made uh, here. And you can look at the other uh, uh, groups also among scheduled tribes. It was excessive, excessive in 2004-05, as late as 2004-05, 82%, actually 83% of the uh, 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 of the scheduled tribes were uh, families were actually below the poverty line. Uh, that did come down by 2011-12 to 62.5 percent. Still a very high figure, but certainly progress nonetheless. And for that, we do have growth to thank. So please do pay attention. Growth is extremely important. Um, one further point on that uh, is uh, uh, another way to think of it is the following, that what we need to do, because growth ultimately is not for the sake of growth. I mentioned that it gives you more revenues, for the, therefore the uh, government's ability to combat poverty and other social problems improves. Uh, but also, growth is supposed to create employment. Now here, I must say that our success has been limited, both nationally as well as in Odisha. Uh, the success in creating employment opportunities, creating jobs, uh, uh, has been rather limited. And, and here are some data which will, which will explain to you what, what the uh, problem is. This is also roughly, I'm going to give you the numbers for the data for Orisha, but actually this is also the state of affairs uh, at the national level. So in Orisha now, about, you know, agriculture produces about 18 to 20 percent of the GDP or GSDP, uh, gross state domestic product. But this is uh, the latest figures we have. These relate to 2011-12 because the National Sample Survey uh, Office uh, does these surveys about every five years. So the last one we have is from 11-12 uh, on employment. But agriculture employs about 56 percent of the workers uh, in Odisha. So 56% of the workers employed in agriculture are producing about 18.7% of the GSDP 
uh, that's lots of people on too little output. And no wonder, therefore, we know that you know, where the poor are concentrated, they're concentrated in agriculture. That is what is reflected in the data that, look, you know, when 57% of the workforce produces, is lives on about uh, 18 to 19% of the uh, output, uh, that is a lot of poverty there. On the other hand, industry in Odisha actually does much better than most other states. Uh, and the, the share of industry uh, in Odisha has been uh, uh, bit about you know 27, 28 uh, percent. Here, however, the employment uh, figures are low. Actually, only 11 percent of the workforce uh, is employed in industry. This is again 2011-12 figures. So. This is an imbalance because industry, although it generates a lot of value added, a lot of output it generates, but it doesn't generate as much employment as it should be. Uh, and this is a national problem. This is really a national problem that when it comes to job creation, uh, and so this is something for my colleague here from CII to think about uh, that uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship, our entrepreneurs, our corporate leaders uh, often end up going into highly capital intensive industries. It's a labor intensive industry that is not done well in India. And by which one means clothing, food processing, uh, electronic industry, uh, light manufacturers of all kinds. This is where China, uh, and before China in the 60s and 70s, South Korea, Taiwan, etc., did very well. And, and really, if you look at the, these very successful countries, uh, about three or four of them from East Asia, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Singapore, uh, initially in the 60s and 70s, China in the last two to three decades. Uh, these con these uh, countries really, uh, in effect, uh, uh, eliminated poverty uh, almost without any anti-poverty programs. What they did was to create jobs, employment opportunities uh, by specializing in uh, these very labor intensive uh, industries and exporting to the world markets uh, in large volumes. Uh, and that, of course, provided employment. So. Not only output share of the agriculture actually declined in these countries during this uh, fast growth period, but also workers moved out of agriculture into gainful employment in industry and services. That movement in India has been uh, awfully slow. Uh, that is something we again need to do. In Odisha, as far as I understand some of the little, little bit of study I did, Clearly, one industry which, which could do this very successfully uh, is food processing. Uh, clearly, there is a, a, a lot of fertile land, and, and Risha is one of the largest producers of uh, things like fruits and vegetables. Uh, these can then be processed into uh, uh, processed food, which in turn actually provide good jobs as well. Uh, so that is one industry, but there is no reason why uh, Odisha also should not be uh, a large producer of clothing, for example, which can then export uh, uh, electronic industry and so forth. These are all industries that provide good jobs uh, and can then provide the transition of the workers. Today, you know, India-wide, for example, 47% of India's farms are smaller than half hectare. Now, no family of four or five can earn, an, earn a living on such a small farm, and about 47% of our farms are of that size. Uh, so clearly we need jobs to be created in alternative employments, uh, industry and services, and that is the pitch which I am making. Uh, Odisha also has one big advantage of very large coast, uh, coastline, uh, and uh, uh, most countries that have grown rapidly, most countries that have transformed, have actually made big use of their coastal areas. You can look at Singapore, you can look at South Korea, you can look at Taiwan, but above all, even China, which has a huge hinterland, which has a huge space inside, but much of the Chinese growth actually came from uh, coast. What the companies located on the coast, imported inputs from abroad, used the Chinese workers to process them and export it back. Uh, that's a process in some of the Indian states is now underway uh, in Gujarat, in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, Orisha has the, uh, the Paradip, Airpo uh, uh, Paradip port, uh, seems to me is a fantastic port. It's a deep, dredge, uh, deep draft port, which can bring in ships that can carry large containers uh, and, and so therefore can facilitate the kind of industrialization, uh, uh, employment creating industrialization that some of, the some of these other 
countries that I have mentioned have done, some of the states within India, Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat are doing. Uh, so I think that's uh, uh, something to consider. Uh, finally, let me say one last thought, that in India, generally, I think, you know, in terms of uh, uh, our, our expenditure on social programs, uh, I think we have been very diffused. What we have done is to start far too many different programs. And what that does is to dilute the resources, uh, you know, when you're trying to uh, do too many things, uh, the, the impact kind of tends to dilute. Uh, uh, also, focus tends to get lost. Uh, what most of the successful countries that I've mentioned did largely is one, they focused on employment generating growth, and second, they focused in a big way on education. Uh, if you go back like South Korea, for example, even when it was relatively poor in the 1960s, by late 1960s, South Korea had achieved literacy rates of close to about 90 percent. Uh, so I think this is where uh, we ought to make a truly, truly big push. Uh, we should really uh, take this in emission mode, uh, set ourselves the goal uh, of uh, near 100% literacy maybe within next 10 years or so. But, but this is where I think the greatest returns are. This is where growth and social spending, education and growth, they are self-reinforcing. Please remember that if, if people uh, are educated uh, and if people uh, have their minimum level of income, and if the government provides the basic infrastructure, roads, electricity, water, uh, sanitation, then people themselves can figure quite a lot on their own. I think our approach has been a little bit not trusting the beneficiary. At the end of the day, beneficiary himself or herself uh, knows what is good for him or good for her. And I think, you know, if we can empower them with higher incomes, uh, we can empower them with better education. Uh, so both, I mean, not just quantity, I mentioned that, you know, get, taking literacy to 100%, but also the quality of education is very important. I think that has been a major, major uh, lacuna in our system. Also, vocational education has to be part of that educational uh, push as well. But if we can really do that uh, uh, and then provide the basic infrastructure connectivity uh, to the people, I think there's a lot else that people can figure on their own. So on that note, let me thank you all again. Let me thank uh, Minister Pradhan for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.